Java is sitting far away, so you won't hear which your language, our language is going to be fine. <laughs> uh, so this is the last uh, Hadoop user group for this year. It doesn't mean the last ever. Uh, we will resume next year again. Uh, uh, so far, uh, this year was pretty good, but uh, it will help us immensely if you guys will start thinking about topics that you want to present or maybe topics that you want to hear about because uh, it's a fairly small community. We can uh, pretty much always find people that uh, was on one or other topic. Uh, with this, this I think is our first attempt to do it in IBM. And uh, thank you, IBM, for hosting us tonight. And thank you, IBM, for pizza. And thank you, Trevor, for beautiful presentation. We have no idea what it is, but I'm sure <laughs> it's going to be great. All right, thanks. Um, a thing I want to start off by asking is just kind of get a feel for the audience. Um, how many people would consider themselves, like, I want to put this in, like, this new paradigm that I don't even agree with, but you know, there's these data scientists and the data engineers, maybe we have system architects. But for this case, I want to kind of put it on the scale of, you know, I work with data, I move data around, I handle in distributed fashions, I do all that, or the I do math, I get, you know, I keep it, it's that, like a mathematician sort of thing. So data engineer, broad bucket, raise your hands. Um, and then mathematicians, data scientists, and Good, okay, good hybrids. Okay, um, awesome. So looks like we got more data engineers. Um, and I wanna start that with that question because this, first of all, I don't agree with that division. I think it's um, inappropriate and I'm not really sure how we got there. Um, I mean, obviously there's people who specialize in wrangling data and that's awesome. But for the mathematician side, you know, it's, this idea that now data engineers support a data scientist and distribute their algorithms. No, that shouldn't, it's not something I like. It's, it's a way things have developed, but it's not great. So the reason I wanted to start with this, though, is this project represents these things coming back together. And so there's going to be a lot of math up front that might seem, you're going to be sitting in your seats like, I, I just signed up for a math class, and this isn't really in my scope at all. And I want to let you know that all I'm doing is laying down some motivation because toward the back, we're going to get into the stack and how these things happen and how all that, the back end, that's going to really, I think, sing to you and speak to you. So um, before you get, so I guess bear with me, I guess is what I'm saying, you the engineers and the data wranglers. Um, oh, so here's our overview. Um, we're going to do an intro. We're going to do a little background on the who um, and what it's up to. Um, and the big part of the hoot is rolling your own algorithms, and that's the exciting thing. And in that future part of what's coming, you might have seen in the abstract, we were kind of hinting and teasing at GPU, CPU, native integrations. And if that's the plan, we're going to actually talk about the whole stack and then how the GPUs and the CPUs add on to that. Um, some other cool upcoming things. So, about me. Uh, Trevor Grant, I've uh, been hanging out. Oh, oops, that's darn. Just pulled this right at all. Well, I'm Trevor Grant. I'm a committer to the Apache Mahu project. Um, I've been, done a lot of work on Apache Streams Incubating, Flink, Zeppelin, open source technical evangelist here at IBM. Um, you can reach me at Rock and Trouble on Twitter, Trevor D. Grant at Gmail. Slides will be available and they'll not be chipped off. So, yeah, this is just, I don't know how to fix this. Um, bummer. Any rate. So, getting to know Mahout. Um, Apache Mahout, a machine, it's an environment for doing math in a distributed scale, scalable way. It, um, since the old days of Apache Mahout, it was you know, the original machine learning on MapReduce. And since then, we've done a lot of, we've moved to now the backing is Spark and Flink, we have multiple backends. Um, Developed in a syntax and visualization. Uh, we also do a lot of work about relationships between Mahout and uh, Spark and Map. 
yes, I, uh, I can do that. Um, Set the level for it. I will. Um, so off the from the I'm gonna I'll start I'll set this page with Spark ML versus Apache Mahout at a very grossly over the top meta level, and I want to revisit this question at the end, but just to set the page because we have Mahout that's running on Spark. How many people are familiar with SK Learn Python machine learning package uh, and versus R? Also statistic. You say okay, they're both in the same domain space. Where I would say SKLearn is more of a bag of algorithms, of machine learning algorithms, and R is more, especially the original R. Here's matrix implementations and roll your own, and that's why the CRAN has developed so much because people have been able to smoke, submit their own packages. But it's much easier to, you know, it has matrix A times matrix A transpose, and people are able to implement their own algorithms. So in that example, and it's not great. It's a it's a weak metaphor. Mahout is more like the R, and Spark ML is more like the SKLearn. It's got a bag. It's got a bag of algorithms. Hopefully, what you want's in there, or you can kind of tweak it out. But if it's not, put it out. Put out a full feature request because that's that's your option. Especially at this point, I know they're trying to update that and fix it a little bit. But um, has anybody actually been in the Spark ML code base? Don't go. It's bad. It's so scary. <laughs> um, <coughs> recent work on the project. Since 09, uh, I believe release 0 0.9 is when we began with the Spark bindings. We started moving that direction. Um, the Mahout Samsara, the, the domain specific language that we're going to talk about, came up in the 011 re release. It's got a new book out um, that's been out since February, talking about um, added Flink as a back end in April 16. Integrated with the Apache Zeppelin notebooks. Uh, that was kind of my baby, and I uh, worked really hard. And it just got merged earlier this month, giving us th that visualization uh, aspect. And I'm going to talk about that a little more later. And we're currently working on uh, back-end CPU GPU optimizations, which also going to talk about. So uh, let's think about if we were just going to abstractly think about an ideal language we would want for doing distributed math. Some of the properties we would want. A language that's mathematically expressive, that we don't have, that doesn't feel so much like Java, that feels like we're just saying matrix A times matrix A can't transpose. Much like the R languages, that you can go from paper, like academic journal paper, to code. And it's very easy to do that. And that's important because um, a lot of these advanced algorithms and formulas are complicated, and the person who wrote them might be one of the old, very few, if only people qualified to even say, is this even doing what it's supposed to be doing? And that makes it, never mind the code going into it, just looking at the algorithm. There's maybe a very small subset of people who understand how that's supposed to work. And so then you filter that subset by people who happen to know your language, and now you've got, you've got no one to bug check you with. You know, that's, you unit tests and things like that, but it's, uh, the, the term deep magic, the, the code that only you know a few people know how to mess with. Um, we would want to base in a language that we wouldn't want to write our own language. We don't want to write our own scripting language. We don't want to make people relearn the wheel and come up with a whole new thing because that's just another language to learn. It's tedious. And then we've got to support the IDs. We want a language that already kind of exists and we want to kind of work our way into that. And then we can leverage everything that language already has for us. We would want uh, we want it to be back end independent. Because backends come and go. There was Mahout, there was Tez, and there was Spark. Flink's coming, probably not going to be a batch one, but who knows? I mean, is Spark going to last forever? Spark itself has many API breaking changes from release to release. So even in just the world of Spark, from Spark 1.6 to Spark 2.0, you could almost consider those backend, different backends, um, because they're so different. Scala 2.11 to Scala 2.9. These algorithms are so hard to write and understand, we don't want to have to port our code every time the back end of the, the fashionable back end changes. We want, I mean, isn't that the dream in all programming stuff, I'm sure, but it's something that if we're coming up with an abstract and ideal language, that's something we'd like to have. Um, and as we know about our, the optimizers we have, like our, uh, in Spark and Flink and SQL, even old SQL databases, well, in algebra, there's optimizations we can do. 
if someone does something that's somewhat silly or something that we can do in a more efficient way based on you know the underlying engine, we want to optimize that. We don't want to do extra steps just because we were instructed to. We want to simplify the problem for the person if and where we can. Would be nice. Um, so enter Mahut Samsara. Mahut Samsara is the uh, what the, the, the project code name, if you will, for the reboot we did in um, 011, where we added a Scala domain specific language and a Scala programmers, one or two, couple, three. So in Scala, they have a concept of domain specific languages. And I was reading Dean's book, and I think it's chapter six. And basically, the, the cliff notes of it is in Scala, you can, if you choose to do so, throw all the syntax out the window and come up with your own. I'm like, that's insane. Why would anyone choose to do that? Um, as it turns out, here it is. Because we, so now we create a domain specific language, and that domain being linear algebra. Um, and now all of, the, all of our Mahout code works right alongside all of our regular Scala code, but we've just added this entire abstraction to the language that allows for this matrix algebra. Case in point, um, this is the distributed stochastic uh, principal component. It's an algorithm from in there and is easily expressible, um, you know, cross products, your dot products in one line. And it's very easy to read. If you've got that, hopefully in some documentation nearby, people can, this is an easy bit of code to read and they can, this is the essence of the algorithm. There might be some code up above setting up, you know, SQ inside and the C matrix and the B matrix, but the heart of the algorithm, we understand what it does, and it's easy to see, maintain, to read, if we need to change it, if we want to tweak little things. We can express it in some latex, we can express it in some code. And that's a really important thing, in my opinion, for this kind of work. Um, especially if you're reading other people's journal articles, and you want to take, okay, so I'm reading about this, and I'm, this is the algorithm I need. Go to the next step. All right, I can implement. Um, which brings me to the next point, the system agnostic are like ESL. So this we can't see, so I'm going to jump out real quick. We have, nope. I'm going to zoom in, let me know when you can see it well. Good? Visible? In the back? A little more? I lose the side by side. It's just, it's just short so I can go. Can you see? Yeah. When I come here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, then I can I can say in broad strokes that what we have here is Spark run this is Spark code. This is Spark Scala. This is an Apache Zeppelin notebook. Familiar with Zeppelin? Everyone? Okay. Uh, at least that it's a notebooking thing. Um, we have Spark code on this side. We have Flink code on this side. From this line up, we have a few different imports, different bindings, different, you know, some of the same imports and a few different ones. Now, we set up what we call the Mahout distributed context by wrapping, in the Spark case, the Spark distributed context or the, fl the Flink context, the Flink environment, um, to create our Mahout distributed context. And from here on, this is a basic ordinary least squares regression, which we'll get into a little bit, but the code is precisely the same. Our Mahout code transfers, copy and paste back and forth. The algorithms you implement, as long as they have a runner in the engine and has its proper bindings all set up, and we are continuing to add and look at new things, we're trying to decide what's going to be next, what should be the next engine, that code is copy paste. So all that and time and investment you put in developing those algorithms and those mathematical methods, you get to keep from version to version of Spark, from Spark to Beam, if that's the next step, Spark to Arrow, um, and that's a really exciting thing. And I agree, like I said, that it'd be great if we could do that on all our code, but at least this is one fairly expensive block of code because you're paying, you know, not only good programmers, but also good programmers that understand math to put this together. So you don't want to have to keep reinventing it every time. You don't want to have to keep porting it across different, you know, because then that's where mistakes happen too. So, I'm going to quickly go through. This is uh, the data types that we have. Um, 
And there's a lot of good documentation on this. And if and when you start playing with Mahout, you can re reference the documentation. You're not going to remember what I say here. So I'm just going to point out some things. But as I go through this, how many people have programmed R? OK, awesome, a lot. You know, play. Um, and so you're going to notice that this is very R-like. Um, and if not even R, maybe Python. It's, very, it's also very kind of Python-y. And then it's simple, and it's easy to read, and it does what it's saying. Dense vectors, sparse vectors, ma matrices, also kind of similar. We also have MATLAB bindings. If you're more familiar with that, you can, you can get MATLAB. Um, the distributed row matrix. The distributed row matrix is the Mahout. The RDD is to Apache Spark. What the data set is to Apache Flink, it's our distributed set of data. It's a matrix that's broken up over the entire cluster. It's lazily evaluated, um, and much it has it shares many of the same properties. In fact, it is usually a wrapper around the RDD or the data set or whatever the, the underlying is. So it has the same kind of properties, um, and it lives in memory, etc. And the but the distributed row matrices for the most part share all the same operators as a regular inform matrix, which we also can support. Um, usually I think the exception is assignment, because you can't, you can assign, you know, to position five, five in a matrix, a number, you can't do that in a distributed matrix. Um, you'll notice again, this is, a, we're going through the operators, very R like, percent star percent, matrix times vectors, um, we can do slicing. Uh, slicing is a concept in R and Python. We can take, you know, I want columns 1 through 6, and I want rows 20 through 2,000. Take little slices, uh, you know, chunks of the matrix, which is something that can't be done traditionally in RDDs because there's no real reason to introduce with the data frames in Scala or Spark, kind of, sort of, but it wasn't something that was meant to be done. Um, and so that's a really exciting thing. So, and something that ha comes about when you're trying to work with matrices and you're doing like, you know, you only need to take this column because maybe that's your Y or so. Um, summaries, n row, call sums, row means, row sums. Um, again, things that you need and just your data, your daily driving and doing math on matrices. <clears throat> um, also, though, yeah. Decompositions, and this is where things really start to get interesting because we can solve set linear systems of equations, find eigenvectors, and here's where we start being able to really do those heavy duty math things that you need, you know, to like solve. Okay, now great, I've expressed an equation. How do I actually solve it? How do I solve for this? How do I take the inverse of a matrix when a matrix is really a distributed data set? Um, and who remembers doing matrix inverses from college? How many people actually specifically remember how to do it or just like kind of partially blocked out like memories of pain that go along with such things? It's a, it's, it's a difficult thing to do and keep track of. And when you start trying to think about how you would do it on an RDD, it's doable, but isn't it nice someone's done it for you, um, especially when it comes to solving matrices? Uh, also caching, um, distributed contributions, um, just like you would have caching of RDDs, same general um, idea. We call it checkpointing. And so we have a concept of in-core matrices, and we have distributed matrices. And in-core matrices, um, again, have a few things that can be done. Um, there's only a few things that can be done to an in-core matrix that can't be done to a DRM. And it's mainly things like assigning. So just like if you took an RDD and then added one to every value in the RDD, your result would be a new RDD. You wouldn't say the same RDD. You wouldn't assign it. It's the same general principle when you're working with distributed matrices. Um, so, all right. Now I'm going to get into some more of the exciting part. So I've point I've laid out now that we have a language for expressing mathematics um, in a distributed manner, and that by itself I would hope is going to be compelling. That's something that is of value, and we're no longer reg regulated to whatever. The Spark community has decided what are the distributed algorithms that you need, or having to hand code very lengthy, lots of boilerplate algorithms that will fit into whatever thing. So, 
We have, again, we have some decomposition algorithms. These are the main algorithms that come with the Pico, and these are the things that just let us do matrix inverses or pseudo inverses and start solving system of equations. And then we get into we do ordinary least squares. Ordinary least squares, um, as a quick reminder, is, uh, can you guys at least see the, the formulas? As a quick refresher, ordinary least squares, we have y um, times a matrix x times a vector of betas plus an error. That's, you know, and we want to find this vector of betas that we you know, call the effects um, or the features. And we solve that, there's a lengthy proof, but this is basically what, how you solve for the betas. And you can also rewrite that as x, um, x transpose times y times x transpose times x times beta hat. We'll solve for beta hat. And in Mahout, once again, this is very elegantly expressed. You pretty much go from this to this. Maybe you've rewritten it a little bit ever so slightly, but that's how we express that. And you could say, well, I can do that with stochastic gradient descending spark. What's the real value here? But for starters, if you're looking at t-scores and you want to tell if your variables um, are statistically significant, which in big data, there, that's a whole other argument, but of course they will be used at a million rows. But aside from that, if you need those things that come out of the side, that you get extra when you're following these traditional statistical methods, that you they get abstracted away when you fall back on stochastic gradient descent. Um, so, if you guys are playing with this later, I'm just going to also point out, this is a fun little trick you can do. Spark does come with a data generator, a synthetic data generator. Um, on this cluster I've done, I've gotten it to work at uh, 100,000 rows, no, I'm sorry, 100 million rows by 100 columns dense. And I've, again, not stochastic gradient descent, ordinary least squares with matrix multiplication, you know, matrix x, x times xd solved. Um, and this is a fun notebook you can play with. These notebooks will all be available in the repos. <clears throat> and it's a, so it's a good thing to, yeah, it's a fun thing to play with because you can see, hey, how big can I get this? How can I, how much data can I throw at this before I break it? Another fun little toy in here is this little snippet of code will take an RDD of labeled vectors in Spark, which is kind of the basis of at least the old MLib, and will convert it into a DRM for you for doing your other uh, matrixy things. So, so on the linear regression, there's another really good example that we have that uh, we start with uh, some serial data. And I can go through in general, this is how we parallelize if you wanted to hand code a matrix. This isn't really what this is meant to do, but um, you can slice taking, so that's what I was talking about earlier, you can take the first four columns, that you say those are your x, and you want the last column to be your y. So you take your slices and set up your vectors, um, estimating beta through simple means, or through simple you know, code that's easy to follow, and solving. You can also then apply the tests, like goodness of fit. Um, and again, all it takes is reading a Wikipedia article and implementing yourself. We had a bias term uh, because we have C bind. Just like Python and R, we have a C bind. We just C bind one to a matrix. Now we've added an intercept term. Um, so now let's get into something a little more exciting. Um, mathematicians, autocorrelation. Do you remember? Okay, so Durbin Watson test statistic is a way to measure autocorrelation. I guess at this point I'm just beating a dead horse that given a simple, um, or given a, an equation, it can be very easily and concisely expressed into a function. And again, all in Scala, you, you're writing this just right alongside everything else in JetBrains, and when you import those Mahout packages, you're getting the IDE support just like that. It's going to be giving you, you know, the co-completion and everything like that. One more time, uh, the cochrane orcutt procedure fixes betas um, and when you have autocorrelation, and a little bit more wordy, but it's a little bit more advanced. It was a little bit more of an indefinite algorithm. So <clears throat> the next big part of this is if you're doing math in a, 
pro a programming language like R or Python, one of the big things that they have that is valuable is that we have the ability to visualize our results really quickly and easily. And so this is a big part of the Zeppelin integration because in Apache Zeppelin, you can write in one language and then the next paragraph can be a different language. And basically what we're doing is we're taking a sample of our, whatever we're gonna graph, we just hand it off to R and Python. So really everything in the R and Python libraries exists now, is very, can work right alongside in the booth. Um, examples of this are, again, some, some tiny code. It doesn't really matter, you can check it out later. But the gist of it is, we made a random sign function in both Mahout and Spark, or I mean in Flink, Mahout and Flink Spark. We passed them both off to R, and then we graphed. The red dots are the sample that we got from Flink, and the blue dots are the sample we got from Spark. Um, Zeppelin also has interactive charts in Angular, uh, and you have 3D plotting. So I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll be preaching to the choir if I'm talking about the, the 3D charting and the exciting stuff in R. It's all out there and we have it to analyze all of our packages in the boot. Um, this is, how many people have heard of eigenfaces? The eigenfaces problem? All right. Um, it is a way for classifying faces. Their neural networks have gotten a lot of popularity. They're popular, but eigenfaces is much more practical. And in this, and the way this works is, um, make sure that one. So visually, you have uh, well, okay. So an eigenvector. If you have a big space of numbers, like you, you can express the entire space of numbers with a few number of vectors that will cover the space. And then everything's a linear combination of some of those vectors. So in the same way, what we can do is consider <coughs> a large set of faces. We've got about 13,000 faces. They're all up to 250 pixels by 250 pixels. And now we want to classify these faces. Um, and so the way we can do that is we can say, instead of saving all these faces and training because also another part of this problem is as new people come along, we need to decide, is this a new person and then add them to the set or is this somebody we've already seen and then say, this is Charlie or this is you know, Susie. And so we start with this set of faces. Um, and then if, it's, uh, if, it is so, if it is a new face, then basically we say, then this new person is a new linear combination. Um, and that's how we match it. So we say, Every person is, on average, you know, we get a set of these faces, these eigenfaces, and they're a linear combination. And we can go through now, like we've got 10,000 people, we just have 10,000 linear combinations. And if we get a new person, we say, we look at, okay, they're a linear combination. I'm just going to go through it. It'll make more sense once you see the end. All right. So the majority of this code here, and the, especially the ugly stuff, um, is we are... This is vectorizing faces. This is just plain Spark. The only reason we use Spark is because Spark will load binary images easier from HDFS, uh, the sc.binary files. Flink doesn't have a clean, comparable component, so we just went with Spark on this one. All the code after this paragraph is totally, um, is a behoof. It's independent of the back end. So we load some binary images, we load all our base data, we turn it to grayscale, we turn it to pixels, we map each 200, 250 by 250 array of pixels into a vector. So now we have this big uh, data set that's basically uh, 13,233 rows by 62,500 columns, if you will. It's our matrix. Yawning or stretching or question? Oh, I thought you were here. Okay, all right. But, uh, um, a, is a, a pixel is a column or something in this? No, in this... Um, each image is a row, and then yes, each pixel is a column. Yes, exactly, that's how that comes out. So the first pixel, well, the first column will always probably correspond to like the zero, zero pixel. And then I'm not sure exactly which way it vectorizes, but then you know, zero, one, two, three, three, three. And that's how it goes, so we just flatten that out. So that's the matrix, if you can imagine. So then we mean center all of the row, of all the columns, because that's given to us as part of the algorithm. Um, we do a single value decomposition, and because that's what the paper, it's Nathan Halko's paper, that's what he calls for, um, and it's solved. That's 
uh, I, we were actually hoping to get a lot more Mavu code in here, but it ended up being a little too easy. But we wrote all our files out to disk and then displayed them like, I don't know, it looks pretty cool, we should keep it. Um, and so the idea is what we've come up with here is 20 eigenfaces, and every face in that data set of 13,000 can be expressed as a linear combination of, in grayscale of these 20 eigenfaces. That, does that, does that kind of make sense now? Does it make it a little, okay, me just trying to talk in circles. Um, and so, if every person is expressed as, like, let's say I have five pictures of, you know, Joe. I've got five pictures of Joe, and okay, so I say on average, Joe's, um, you know, parameters, the linear combination are like this. So when I get a new image, I've got that, I've got that set of parameters for everyone, for every person. All I have to do to classify a person is I go through every person and their set of parameters in one sweep, and I say, is this new person close enough to anyone that I've already seen? And if they are, then I say, okay, this is so and so. And if they're not close enough, I say, okay, this is someone new. I just added, I just tack that vector onto the end, and then I keep going. And then that way, compared to neural networks, which are much more computationally expensive to train, to, to do things with, this is a much more useful, if you will, real world. If you're trying to classify people online and get more people coming in all the time to the data set. Um, and it's just that easy with Mavu. It was really about four or five lines of code. Like I said, we spent a little bit of time vectorizing our images out and then writing them back to disk. Um, and that's really, really exciting. I mean, that was, because, and that's how it should be. Because if you read the paper, there's about six equations. To be fair, we kind of loaded it because the singular, the singular value decomposition was actually what the whole paper was about, and we just happened to have that one already lying around for us. But it's still a very valuable thing for finding his particular approach was how to do it in a distributed fashion. But it's still a very valuable thing, and you'll find it um, a lot of times in a lot of things. So, as promised, for the engineers, thank you for staying around with me. We're going to get into some of the backends and the optimizers and all the cool engineering stuff that uh, really matters. The stack chart that everyone's used to seeing. How is our, what's our stack? Um, this is especially hard to see on this, so I'm going to point and elaborate. We've got our application code. So there's a Scala shell. Um, just, this is just your pure Scala. Now you've got the, the Scala DSL, which is your Mavu code. So you've got your regular Scala script, and you can have your regular Scala functions and anything else you want. And as it goes through, okay, okay well, there's also these other DSL functions that we're going to read, like the imports, if you will. Now at that point, the in-core stuff just goes in-core, and we just handle it in-core, and that's just do as you would any Scala-based math package, and there's really nothing special. Now, the distributed stuff first goes through a logical um, DAG, a physical DAG, and then from there, either it goes to Flink, Spark, or we also have H2O. So we're, that's where the binding's coming. We're actually translating it to that native engine code. And any engine we support then, that means we've come up with that translation code already. Um, and so from there, okay, we do that, and then it just runs like an H2O job, a Spark job, a Flink job, as they do. Um, and then it's really back to doing, we're doing in-core algebra now at the local level. And with some shuffling of things around and keeping track because you've got now a big matrix. <coughs> One place, and you said the DAG chart. Yes. Uh, the problem is with the gradient descent, which is a method for a logical problem, mm -hmm. it's not really DAG. Agreed. Agreed. Um, so you, go ahead. You got to deal with this, but for me, at least, it's really difficult. So far as I know, we have some gradient descent, but it's in the old MR stuff. I've never used gradient descent on the newer things. And so this is another thing. There's code out there that I'm not 100% familiar with. So it's entirely possible that whatever I'm saying, folks at home, is absolutely incorrect. But I'll do my best to make things up as I go. Um, <laughs> the two DAGs that were here, we're actually going to talk about those and like specifically what they do. And they're doing things like making sure if you're doing like a times, if you're doing matrix times itself transpose, it's not doing senseless shuffling around because, you know, each row just needs to talk to itself. So let's not shift the entire, you know, shuffle the entire matrix. That's what these two DAGs are doing. And then 
you've also got the DAGs that pop up in Spark and Normal. So with, when I say these two DAGs, they're just doing the, um, they're, just, they're just checking your math. They're trying to make sure you've got the simplest, the simplest plan based on what it is that all in all you're trying to do. Loops will still be handled as loops, um, so far as I know. So for, yeah, your the, the stochastic, Yep, and the pain in flink is the loops go fast, but there's no checkpointing, so it's you gotta get it's you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, the upshot that I will say is so as we're talking about loops, on the spark, spark loops are basically like for loops, no matter what you do, right? You're just it's just tearing everything down and doing it up again. Um, as far as I know, that's how it will translate. I haven't done a loop and, or anything iterative. I know there is some looping that's done in like in the decompositions, but I think it's just I think it's just normal loops. I I believe. No, but the great loop is the one the example two of where it just runs through the tree the whole thing runs. And then it just does it with great loop. Yeah. But I think the normal one does kind of the same thing that it's mm -hmm. doing. And, but even then, like I said, it's fine, but then you can't checkpoint the output. And so it, it, it'll do your math really fast for you, but you better do something with it as soon as it comes off the line because it's going to fall, it's going to disappear really quick. Um, yeah. I want to say, yeah, I think the loops, so, and to that point, I will say that while the language, I guess, the language is consistent across the different backends. H2O, which I can't even begin to speak to, I've never messed with it at all. Um, but the Spark and the Flink, you will run into that, you will get performance differences, and different things happen at different rates. Um, there are quirks that'll, depending, even though, so your code will still be valid and executable, but as you swap out backends, experiences may vary. I guess I will. What's up? Or with the sound easier, it's five times slower. Or checkpointing, because there's the checkpointing isn't ironclad, and so if there's a checkpoint deep in something, then your bugs will pop up. You know, like there's, um, it, there's yeah, it could or it could be super slow, or it doesn't want to handle different size things. Um, Flink has issues if because it's all distributed out. Spark can Spark can live with itself if there's an empty partition. Flink has a harder time doing that, and sometimes we'll throw a fit. And so that's another thing that exists kind of at the deeper levels that um, you will become you will become an expert on the very the limitations of these different systems when you start playing with this because you'll see where it hits the wall really fast. So that's one thing. On that OLS example that I showed earlier, that's a really fun toy for teaching yourself the two Spark partitions because you're just giving it a ton of data and a huge job to do, and you get a real quick sense of like, how much partitioning do I need to do to make this, you know, if I do that on five partitions, it'll run like four days. If I, if I step up to 5,500 partitions, it'll run pretty quick, but then I get other kind of problems. Um, so send your executor sizes. Like I said, it's, it's, a great, it's a great exercise in learning the limitations of your underlying systems. Um, so the optimizations, um, you've got, yeah, so given that you've got, um, you're given some code, and it's going to, just like any uh, optimizer, it's going to read through and try to figure out, like, what's the overall plan here, and what are the ways I can get there that are less um, costly. <clears throat> Algebraic, uh, let's see, we want to, um, there's common computational paths, paths like, you know, matrix times matrix transpose self um, that just pop up often and often, and these are the ones we've written up, and like, there's lots of optimizers against. Different ones coming all the time, um, and coming soon, but let's see. The example I want to give would be like the A times A transpose, because um, this is illustrative. There's lots in here, there's lots of like where it has to choose this or that, but um, if you were doing this like if you were just writing this code and you wanted to come up with a way to take matrix A times matrix A transpose, it would be intuitively, you go through matrix A and then 
repartition and then multiply it times each other, shuffling all the things around. But you don't need to do all that because that would be, I guess the first way we're saying is if you just had a matrix, any given matrix times any other matrix, the way you would do it is you would take, okay, well I need to go through this matrix and then I need to go through this matrix again to like create a transposed version of it and then I need to multiply the two together. Creating, a, if you will, in spark terms, an intermediate RDD. But that's not necessary for self times self transpose because <clears throat> graphically, this is what's happening. You've got this RDD, these color coded things, and really the things that need to be multiplied times themselves already exist together. And so we can get some speed ups like that. And so does that kind of make sense? Yes. Here you have to go column. Unless you have APIs to go columns. We do have APIs to go columns, but because it's going. It, it will go across MPT, so it's going to be basically very slow. And I didn't write this part, so I don't know exactly, and I need to. So, <clears> um, But if. So the whole idea here is that it's. That's the version that it's trying to stop it from doing. That's the, the optimization in there. It's keeping it from having to go like, take that first element of the first row and run it down to every different thing. So you're getting like, um, how do we go about it? I should have read these slides and learned this better before I thought about it. All the columns at the same time, so it goes first. Yes. Yeah. 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 Really exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and physical operators, same. Uh, or so that was the logical DAG. So it does that first, and then also um, has operators for. Then it looks at things and it, it'll optimize things so it'll say, okay, you're a skinny matrix. And so I know that I can do, I can handle you in a certain way versus if you're a fat matrix or if you're a sparse matrix. And so what it's going through is, you know, it's checking the size of the matrix and making determinations on, you know, what's the, what's the best way. And these are all, as I believe, kind of hand coded heuristics. They're like anything over this big of a dense matrix we should try to keep it from shuffling. Let's repartition, like example, let's, let's repartition things together before we do this. But if it's too big, like that's gonna be, it's gonna be more expensive repartitioning at this size, so let's keep the partitions and just shuffle or you know, move things around as needed. Um, so that's that second level of DAG that it hits before getting down to like the spark layer stuff. So really all it's doing is it's reshuffling your partitions and things of that nature, trying to set the final operation, the final execution up to go as fast as possible, if that makes sense. And so, bringing us to the new CPU GPU integrations, and old stack, same thing, and the idea here is simply enough that once we get down to that level where in any other package, you start hitting the blast level, you know, to do your, your, your vector, and like actually zip things together and do your computations, there's another optimizer at this point that says, well, naively, it could just say, okay, instead of, we're just gonna replace the JVM and all those computations with things being done in the CPU or a GPU if it's available. But what it does, it also has a level of optimization here because it's expensive moving vectors out of the JVM, sending them to the CPU, and then moving them back, or sending them to a GPU, even more expensive, but it's a lot faster. So we don't want to, if we have like a 10 by 10 matrix, that by the time we dump it out of the JVM, go to CPUs, compute it, load it back up, you know, okay, now it's just, it's just 10 times as long just because we were so excited to go get the CPU. So there's optimizers in there too that also have that same kind of, you know, that they have the same heuristics of, is this big enough? Is it, is it worth it to go to CPUs? So first, is it are the GPUs and the CPUs well? 
as I recall from, because I've actually, this is some code I've been in, and from testing, what it will do is it will say, is it worth it? Is this a big enough operation that it's worth going to GPU? And it will say, oh, yeah, yes, and then it'll try to send it to a GPU, and if it exists, um, and you really shouldn't be running that particular plugin if you don't have the GPUs, but it will push it to that GPU then. Um, and then if it doesn't exist, it will go, it'll go to the CPUs, and then it'll say, okay, nothing's there. I guess I'm just doing the JVM anyway. So you added a little bit, but yes. Uh, if you upgrade it with the GPU support, the capabilities of the GPU. I think they're doing. I think they're on a different fork, or they're doing something different. This is uh, as far as uh, GPU aware, it, the executor will know exactly where GPU is there. They oh, they, there's yeah. Well, and so I think the NSCL does take care of that. Um, and that's why it, um, yeah, the VNSCL takes care of like knowing whether it exists or not, if that makes sense. Um, but I guess this is more of a question of parsimonious. Right, and yeah. moreover, you can uh, do your distribution in that spot to say, okay, I want this piece of code to run on GPU number one. Okay, oh, really? Okay, so that's what's in their upcoming two. I think it used to go up to do it. Okay. Um, well, we've been talking about it since May, so that sounds about right. <laughs> Somebody else comes up with a good idea, and they, they set to work. I sort of feel that. Yeah, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> um, another question. Got somebody else I want to. Okay. Um, but no, it is independent of that. This is uh, the NSCL integration, and it, as it needs to be because we can't rely on Spark's GPU self-awareness when Flink doesn't have it. Um, that's so Flink will grab it. I'm, exactly. Well, um, I don't know. It depends on, that gets into like, is Flink really ever going to do anything with machine learning? They kind of will. Sure they will. But not until they get a good table API and that checkpointing, for example, figured out. Like, well, table is already there. Yeah, and then Alibaba's got a lot nicer add-ons for it too, but because um, they've got their own little fork that they're like, well, we need another table API. Yeah, I'm gonna set 800, 1,000 engineers and build their own fork. Um, but I anyway. am a tip of mine because everybody wants to do machine learning on their own plan if that trust the yeah. machine learning. Yeah, yeah. So they will all get this for them. Yeah, I agree. I, they probably will. Uh, it will come about. That being said, we're lazy, I guess. And the other point, I guess, then too, is so the way that this works, it's easier to abstract actually then because we have our it's it's that normal like point that we would just normally call from you know a blast operation, um, and all it is is a little code right there that says first is it big enough? Should this go to CPUs? Should this go to native? And if so, and it's possible, like we have a library. If so, okay, let's ship it to native. Um, now, the downside for that is now you're back into the headaches of compiling for native. You've got to have the Vienna CL that supports you, you have the GPU cards, you know, it's the, all those little quick kinks and quirks that come with, pro, you know, that we got to forget about because we were programming in Java for so long that everybody's little, everybody's system's like a little snowflake and they're all special and different. Um, and, you know, it's, do you have version Vienna CL like 1701? Or one seven zero zero, or one seven zero zero, patch fix point nine three, or like you know every, and you never know because who's going to have what, and you can get little fun and exciting things there too. Ubuntu fourteen oh four versus you know getting everybody up to the same background on the libraries, it's uh, exciting. I've already, I've already, I've already played with it. Uh, so yeah, trade offs, goods and bads, you know, um, and when everybody else does have GPU support. Maybe that'll be a different way to go with it, but um, like I said, is and as we add things like Arrow or Beam, we're just getting started. GPU is not even close to being in their roadmap, and it'd be nice. It's also nice to have that option right there already. Beam for the most part running on the main menu. For the most part, and the other problem with Beam from any we have any Flink user group. Yeah. We had a Beam meetup the other day. The problem with Beam at the moment is it's basically Google Dataflow 
it's very, very data flow and heavy. I mean, it was all data flow, so that's fair. But like doing, if you want to write a streaming source to a sync, your only option is like Google Cloud dot dot dot. You can't do it to a file. It was a regression in their code, but it was really obnoxious when you're trying to do Hello Worlds, and now you've got to like your only option to do it in streaming is to sign up for a Google account. <laughs> yep. I mean, but it's an interesting thing because you know that's one more step in that direction of everybody going for that common API. Like that is something everyone wants. It's a good step in that direction, but what do you mean? Right. Yeah. No, that's but they try. And it's really fun to have to go to their website if you want to know if the difference between Spark and Flink at any given moment. You just go look up the beam compatibility matrix. Gives you a quick little copy reference, but um, yeah. So, oh, let's see, how am I doing on time? Um, so this is been kind of what I was saying. Uh, masters, so basically, your underlying engine takes care of shipping data around for you, and it gets to wherever it's going to go, dumps out to the GPU or CPU in the case you need to do uh, another graphic. Um, but the syntax doesn't change at all. So the the punchline there, you don't have to know GPU programming. Um, last little bit of new stuff. I had said that SK Learn, it's like Spark ML. Well, just like R, at least has a CRAN of pre-built packages for you, a GLM, you know, linear models and stuff like that. That's the direction we're trying to. I've been working on a lot, trying to get. We want to get a consistent API. Um, another thing that's happening in Spark, we're looking at doing pipelines. Spark's looking to open up their pipelines. It would be nice that if we would have our pipelines that you could plug Spark ML algorithms into, or you could plug your Mahout algorithms into your Spark ML pipeline. Because something that does drive me nuts across all these different underlying engines is everyone keeps reinventing the wheel with, you know, everyone's got their own k-means, everyone's got their own stochastic gradient descent. Every time someone comes up with a new engine and they're coming up with an ML package, they gotta write the same 20 algorithms over again. And it's wasteful. You know, there's better things to be doing. So the idea I don't want to read I don't want to do k-means since Spark and Flink both have versions of it, I personally, um, not to say that we won't, but um, it's so that, that kind of, that dead weight loss as we come up with the same 10 common algorithms, let's stop doing that. Let's come up with a place where all the different algorithms can all be together in whatever pipeline. Um, so that's something like that. Um, with that, you know, regressors, transformers, classifiers is the idea. Um, implementing the fit predict transform uh, paradigm with SK Learn. What's up? What they're planning to do in neural net is like a bigger <clears throat> um, In my mind, a neural net is a trans. Neural net's fun because neural net can be all three. Neural net can be used for regression, it can be used to classify something, or you can just have five inputs in and it predicts five inputs out, whatever your target is. Um, because, you know, a neural net from time one could predict the next time. That could be what it's doing. Uh, Sure. Well, we did the same thing. So right. Like you could run yeah, that. I agree. Um, and yeah, I I guess I was throwing up. Um, I would probably end up putting one in there because I've hand code. I've written enough of them that I might do it just because why not? Um, another advantage I will say to this paradigm is because everything is so all the deep learning papers everything's expressed in these very con uh, concise, you know matrix forms, it's very easy to implement them in a way that's readable. So if anything, I would say learning the neural net, like you can write, you can write a neural net that you understand, and if you have some particular flavor of a new neural net that just came off the press, that's not in DL4J or whatever else yet, you could read and implement in a fairly easy, quick, and straightforward way. So that's a benefit of doing it <coughs> in this. So I might have a couple neural nets in there just to kind of example versions. And then, yeah, you want to you read some new, okay, I slap six Boltzmann machines and a LSTM together, and we call it a, a Trevo network. And you can do that if you want to, because you can keep that, you know, or you have, like, those weird learning functions in each side node. You can express those weird learning functions and distribute that out, too. Um, yes. So... No, this has been a long in math because I'm going to type to... This is still work in progress. Um, there's some that are going in there. Uh, 
what's next for Apache Mahu and you? As we're going to have some questions, um, go home and start playing with it. Got <clears throat> compiled jars. What? Oh, yeah. You can either do this, you Java programmers, um, you can, or Scala. You can compile your jars, you use Knit Zeppelin, you do it interactively. I'm a big fan of Zeppelin. Um, whatever, whatever's your bag, man. Join the mailing list, get the book, uh, jump in and contribute. Quick uh, roll call, special thanks to all our contributors and smart people who help us out with implementing really deep distributed things. Um, for anybody downloading, we've got blogs, the, uh, the references. Um, I've got some fun blogs on the Eigenface demo, recreating it, and you know, doing the visualizations, getting into more with that. Picture of our book. Um, so feedback we had from the last time was that you know this is all great and good, but I don't have five node clusters just lying about that I can do anything with. So this is really not particular. I mean, it's interesting, but they might as well be like, oh, no. Nope. What's that? No bonus materials. All right. No, no bonus materials. No bonus materials. We come from all this idea. Okay. Fair, fair enough. enough. Fair enough. Um, then I will say, read the blog. Um, I'm and yeah, then I'm not going to be promoting. I will say that across multiple competitors, Hadoop as a service is becoming a thing. And look into the concept of fire up a five node cloud cluster and just go nuts, you know, and run it on that. Set it up, set up some Zeppelin, do your demos, throw it away. And that is a, a good way to start playing with it because then you get to, you can start to get a feel for, you know, is this as easy as running some R? No, R's got a lot, R is very beautiful and built out cran. Um, but, you have, but there are things you can do. You, you can't do OLS and R. You, you know, you'll find those blocks in R you can't do, and you start coming up with clever workarounds like sampling theory and this and that. Or you can just do, run the algorithm once on your full set. So that would, uh, that's, my, that's my call to action, y'all. And um, thanks very much for your time. <laughs> Questions? Um, the book is Apache Mahoop Beyond MapReduce, um, written by a committer and um, someone very close to the project. Goes through lots of examples, explains in great detail those three dis uh, decompositions that I talked about, kind of the derivation of them, why they are, and what they're the best for. Um, that would be a good place that I would say check out. Um, and also that that kind of that perfect blend of like just enough math so you understand what's going on, but really let's get into like the how and why this is working and what it should be. I'm sorry? You said you were going to use the slides again? I will. Slides will be available. Um, throw them on. I'll throw them on the Hadoop and the Flink Meetup pages um, just in case anybody from the Flink Meetup who said they were going to come wants to see. Um, and we'll probably do the video too. Heavy editing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just out of curiosity, is it the move to a lot of like university or company or like some kind of academic industry type thing? It is a story I should know better. Um, Isabel something. I met her, but I can't remember her last name. They started back in like '09. It was it was early on the math. It was, I don't think it was university. It was Isabel and. Ted Dunning. I think was he on the was he like at the very beginning too? Yeah. I knew he was around since early. Okay. So Ted Dunning, who's um, the head of technology at MapR, is that he's somebody big at MapR. He, he was the head of the guy called the chief solution officer at yeah, MapR. Yeah. CSA. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so um, but I don't believe it came out of the to short answer your question, give myself lots of room for error, I don't think it was a university big, I think it was driven by, okay, we've got all this Hadoop lying around, and we need to start doing, we need we need machine learning. Uh, yeah, this is one of the ways of improving our work on the case. Is it? Yeah. Well, then, um, and, and it's still, um, like I said, then it, it keeps in that tradition, because the 
that the Duke is a service cluster that I get working for IBM, um, I beat the hell out of them. I take them out and just, and we were laughing about it before, like just beat them and beat them hard with absurd things like, I wonder how big of a regression I can, OLS I can do, and I got a synthetic didn't generate, so I just run it, I'm like, yep, it works. Make it, just keep adding zeros until it breaks. Then I start repartitioning and changing my executors and all that schema, and I run it again, and just sit there and like having brownouts in like North Carolina or wherever their servers are. But uh, yeah, and so it's, it's great for that. And can you talk a bit more about Hadoop as a service, maybe not IBM focused, but just a general overview of what kind of what it is? <clears throat> yeah. Um, in general, the idea the idea of Hadoop as a service, just like Spark as a service, you know, you turn on a bunch of Spark executors, you run your Spark job, and then you just turn them back off. Or maybe you leave them up for a little while, you know, because there's different ways you would manage that. But you, in the same, there's all the same concept of Spark as a service. We now have um, the ability to, within a few keystrokes, you know, username, password, set up however many notes, and hit a button, and just wait a few minutes and come back. And now you've got uh, end known yarn cluster lying around. Uh, yeah, there are actually two options. There are paid options mm -hmm. where you go to the cloud provider. Yeah. And uh, most of the big providers today yeah. will provide you for free with a small sample. We can oh, really? control the size, but Fortis okay. Works have their own, Cloud Direct has their own, my park has mm -hmm. their own. Okay. That makes you can go to any one of these. Sure. I and I highly recommend. I mean, and so and to that point, assuming can you get do the other ones have Zeppelin available on them? Uh, maybe one of them. Uh, cloud there probably. So, I mean, it's kind of a neutral project that most I, people are jumping well, on. It. The problem is you are a big fan of Zeppelin. Yeah. Uh, Databricks hate Zeppelin. All oh, that good. Good. Uh, Do this on anybody but data breaks. Uh, well, These they guys are the uh, scam. What's up? They have Park. Data breaks does. Yeah, they do. Um, and and I'll to be candid, got into Zeppelin because we like data breaks, but couldn't go off prem with our data. So we're like, hmm, how do we make that behind our own firewall? And Zeppelin was a good way. Right. Uh, but uh, just to sort of gear around. Uh, yeah. So there are alternatives. Yeah. Also. So I guess then the only reason I would I would I was plugging Zeppelin was because I've got a ton of really fun examples for beating the hell out of stuff just already lying about that you can but you can load any of them up, copy and paste code, and it should work pretty smooth for you. But yeah, it's it's called Spark as well. So yeah, Spark is Spark is Spark. And uh, their claim is that Spark has better local control of the cluster, so you can do okay. cluster money. Oh, I see what you're saying. It's all right. I get that. Um, they yep. control both sides. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So and so in the, in the back to your original question, Hadoop is a service. Um, it depends what you're trying to do. For this, arguably, you could get away with Spark as a service because what are you trying to do? You need some Spark. You got to load some jars into it, um, which are all in Maven, so you can load and you, then it would run. The Hadoop as a service pops up and now you've got depending what you click there's yarn there's which makes you so you can like throw your own you know you can do other weird stuff with it and because you've got the entire Hadoop ecosystem sitting underneath you so depending what you're trying to do might be good and if you're trying to just do weird stuff in Hadoop and see what happens it's great because you set it up break it and you, you know the public part of your business yeah technically Spark is Spark uh, Spark is Hadoop it is but it but it stands by itself. So no, it's just teasing you. What's up? That's teasing you. Oh, you're just teasing me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know, but yes. All right, forget about Spark, forget about it. Forget yep. about all that stuff. It's all abstraction. Okay. Download the hub, get that book, <laughs> forget a book about it, and go through the book with the, the download, follow the book, and you'll know more machine learning than 99.99% of the people out there. But you can't get to that is a you don't have to be distracted by a uh, shared file system, you don't have to be shared by distributed anything. Mm -hmm. Get the book, go through the algorithm, get the test data they have they put out in the book, and you'll know 99.9% of the people out there. You get 
run into a so-called data scientist and start like throwing down some eigenfaces on them. Like, oh, we'll, we'll scan. <laughs> okay, we'll back off. Yeah. Um, what are some of the real world applications for taking linear algebra as opposed to smooth classes in a business paper or algorithm? Such as you're seeing, so people are actually using the linear algebra in the field. Um, it is my opinion, and or my my uns taking both my all my hats off, and just this is just me. Um, Everything in Spark ML, all these prepackaged algorithms, are great for the prepackaged demos with which they go. Um, and that's about, and about as soon as you start trying to do something more than that, even SKLearn, because you're thinking like, oh, it's just like SKLearn, and you're seeing, you, yeah, check the boxes, check the boxes, except SKLearn has a lot of functionality that gets built out, you know, like the different, like, 